I'm going to talk about Clojure Core Async. Uh, I'll try to, I, I really want to talk about the motivation behind it and um, how you should think about it, but I will talk enough about the details so you get a sense of what the API is like, but it's not fundamentally about how to use it or the code. So uh, what problems are we trying to solve? Um, the first problem we're trying to solve is the fact that function chains make poor machines. And uh, if you've heard me speak before about how objects are, uh, were, are like little machines and they're not very good for doing logic, um, functions are like little use, you know, units of logic that are bad for making machines. And it ends up that uh, because we're moving to this world where people are trying to be more reactive, we have a ton of callback APIs on our hands. And we tend to uh, connect to them with chains of function calls. And we're in a situation where we actually need a program that's more like a machine. We're trying to use tools that are for functional programming to do that, and it's a bad fit. So um, how do we fix this? So the, the idea behind, uh, behind this, and it's something that I've said often, is that uh, good programs should be made out of uh, processes and queues. You know, at a higher level, um, you want to move to queues, and you want to move to queues in particular as soon as you're involved in any kind of conveyance within your application, because at that point, it's no, no, no longer nested logic. You're trying to uh, move something from one place to another, maybe from some input through processes in your system that perform calculations or transformations, and eventually out somewhere else. That's a one-way street. Um, so we want conveyance to become first class. Uh, we want to organize our programs this way. And we could always do this, right? If we're on the JVM, it already has queues. Often people have said, you know, why doesn't Clojure wrap queues? And it's because you know, there's already queues and they're perfectly fine. Uh, and as if they're not perfectly fine, and we're going to make them a little bit better with this potentially. But they're there, and they work. But they do have some, some problems. Uh, one is that uh, the only way you can coordinate with a queue, with the Java Util concurrent queue, in other words, to uh, wait for data to be present, is to take an actual thread, a real thread, and and uh, block on the queue. And uh, that has a cost we're going to talk about in a second. Um, also, if we try to look at the whole scope of, uh, of uh, platforms that Clojure addresses, uh, which also include JavaScript through ClojureScript, uh, there are no real threads there, and there are no queues there uh, of any real sort. Um, so using queues directly, looking for queues in, from the host, is uh, not necessarily something we can always do. Um, even when we can do it, there are overheads associated with queues. Uh, and, and people make a lot of this. Uh, and in particular on JVM, there's a definite overhead per thread. I'm sorry, not with queues, associated with threads, um, which is uh, the stack size. You know, every thread has a pretty big stack. And if you tried to have hundreds or tens or hundreds of thousands of threads, uh, you'd consume a huge amount of memory. There's also wake up time and other you know, um, overheads associated with threads. Uh, people often talk about that as if it was a scalability thing. Scalability is not about what happens inside one machine. It's about um, being able to add machines or add resources to make, to make things scale. But it is an efficiency problem, right? Are we making the best use of the machine by using a thread per connection? Um, oftentimes, we're not. Uh, so we'd like an alternative to that. So uh, the, uh, <laughs> the API du jour is events and callbacks, right? This is all back. All the ick from a long time ago from UI development is now like the way to do everything. Uh, we have listenable futures and promises and callback handlers and async APIs for every kind of RPC. And, and invariably, they expose themselves as these um, you know, listenable future or some sort of a callback. And what we end up doing is we put some logic in, into each of these callbacks. It says, you know, on a button click or on a message coming over the pipe or on a whatever, um, do this stuff. And so the stuff is a little piece of logic that we hook up there. And there are lots of these sources of events. And we end up with lots of pieces of logic. And we end up with this giant web of, of these direct call relationships, um, a lot like the kinds of webs we create in object-oriented programs. And it's similarly, they're very difficult to reason about or do control flow. And everybody understands this phrase, call back hell. And we're going to really look more carefully at what that means and what, it, uh, what it's about. But fundamentally, I think it's about having to break your logic up into little pieces so that those pieces of logic can live inside handlers when those pieces are part of a design or, or a way of thinking about a state machine or a way to approach the problem that was all of a piece. 
And the fact that you divided it up has nothing to do with the way you want to think about the problem and everything to do with the artifact of this mechanism for addressing it. And it makes everything difficult. It's difficult to see inside these things, to see which uh, callbacks call which handlers to monitor them, um, you know, on what thread are the callbacks going to be run, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there have been very, you know, various uh, approaches to try to mitigate some of this uh, with observables and Rx and things like that, but they only handle a very narrow set of cases, mostly, you know, filtering or making a stream-like uh, kind of approach to composable transformations on a single event chain. But if, if you really are trying to make a state machine that has multiple sources and sinks of events, uh, you can't just get it out of something like uh, you know, filter and map composition primitives. So what does that look like? Uh, the problem looks like this, essentially. I, I mean, I don't care if in and out are um, queues or, or, or external API calls or sockets or button clicks in a browser or whatever. It's just all sort of generically stuff comes from somewhere else that's input. It's outside of your program and somehow it's going to show up and say, woo, pay attention to me. Right? You have some logic associated with that which you're going to put in a handler um, for that. Uh, and eventually that logic's going to have to produce something and, and, and move it along. So at the top part here, can I wiggle my mouse over this? Oh, no, you don't see that. OK. Maybe I can point. You don't see that either. OK. Up, up above, uh, the in to the logic and the out, those are all function calls, right? The, the input thing is uh, on something, you know, call this function. And inside that function, you eventually call, you know, print or send it out or update the DOM or something like that. And this, this box is not a whole box because the way you thought about this job may have been a state machine. Maybe you're trying to implement you know, some algorithm. You're trying to implement uh, uh, some sort of a state machine. And, and in fact, it involves multiple inputs and multiple outputs. But because you have to break it up into these pieces, you end up with these small, fragmented things. And the problem is, if you really did have a state machine model, uh, you had uh, some logic up here that may or may not need to do something in particular depending on something that happened in the logic down below. And how are you going to coordinate those two things? Because they're both getting separate event streams and they're both running on each event. And the way you do that invariably is having to introduce some shared state. And uh, we all know the kind of party that leads to. And so objects don't fix this, right? Objects just put this in a blue oval. That's about. <laughs> That's all that they do. There's nothing, nothing fundamental about what we just talked about is changed by putting in an object. Okay? Objects are like marionettes, right? Where you know, anybody can pull any string at any time. You know? And uh, you're not going to get an episode of the Thunderbirds out of that. Um, so, so there are interesting things out there. You know, this happens all the time. Well, what's the problem? The problem is we had to take what would have been a single thread of control, and we had to break it up into pieces so that we could run it on callback handlers. And uh, you know, some people have done work in this area already. Um, C sharp and F sharp have uh, async um, primitives, not necessarily oriented around callbacks, but they do something. They are solving the problem of the what I would call reversion of control. Right, which is that you want to call some asynchronous operation, you want to continue to use your thread or, or give your thread back to a pool, and eventually, uh, when, whenever you were waiting, f whatever you were waiting for comes back, uh, somehow resume control. And so the way C sharp style async works is that it takes uh, code that looks linear, uh, but that calls asynchronous RPCs, for instance, and uh, will turn the code in place into a state machine and actually register that state machine on the callback handler. So your code looks ordinary and linear. Um, and this inversion of control is happening under the hood. So it's an interesting idea to, uh, to copy this. I don't know who, who saw Philip's uh, Scala async talk earlier. Good. So, uh, so it's not a bad idea. To, uh, to think about copying this. And uh, Scala did that. And uh, I saw Philip's talk in the spring, I guess. And I was like, hmm, that's not a bad idea. We could just copy that enclosure. And it would look like something like this. And this is not what we ended up doing. But uh, it shows you the idea, right? So up, up top, you have traditional blocking code, right? You, there's some future. The future is blocking. When you deref it, you're waiting. You're wasting. You're tying up the thread. 
um, and you're wasting resources. Um, in the second place, uh, you use something like callbacks. So now you have a, a, a listenable future, and you'd say, on completion of the future, you know, do this job. And it looks kind of straightforward here, but if you were in the middle of a loop uh, or something else, or you had multiple things you wanted to wait on, this would get really nasty, trying to fabricate what the callback handler would be and have it capture the context of a, of a linear-looking program uh, segment. Uh, would be very difficult. So what uh, C-sharp style async does is it says, well, just put that code in some sort of a special construct we'll call async. And then instead of uh, registering a handler with a callback or actually blocking on it, you'll make a call to await, um, which semantically is blocking. It's like the first, it's like the first code here. Uh, but some magic, uh, and in the case of C-sharp, it's some compiler magic, is going to go and look at this block of code and say, uh, OK, I see that you're trying to do an, an asynchronous thing. Let me analyze this block of code. Let me turn it into a state machine that actually can be called back. Let me uh, uh, register that state machine as the callback handler for that future and relinquish the thread. So the thread is no longer running. Um, and what happens is the code that you want to have be the continuation, if you will, of, of that future is stored away in, an, in, a, in, a, in a blob of a state machine that will eventually be called upon to run on a, on a, a thread from a thread pool. And that allows you to share. And it's, a, it's really a great approach to this. It makes for linear code and uh, allows you to use the machine efficiently because you can share this thread pool. You can have lots of these pending um, you know, future actions. But notice in particular, this is really RPC. And that's sort of the problem. Um, you know, I walked away from the talk saying, that would be a cool thing to copy. And then like after a weekend, I was like, uh, you know, because the promises and futures, it's not actually the first problem I talked about. Right? The first problem I talked about was true asynchrony. Right? Somebody clicks on a button, or something comes over a socket. Um, your code didn't initiate that the same way the code we saw on the previous slide did. That's code that says, go and do this. And then when it's done, you know, come back. And I want to relinquish the thread in the meantime. These things are actually happening asynchronous. So promises and futures are sort of uh, lightweight constructs. You know, they're one night stands, right? They're just handoffs or call and return scenarios. They can't really model you know, enduring connections. And so they're not actually help for, for this. So it's sugar. I mean, it's, it's good sugar. Um, but I, I felt like uh, we should put it on a better cake. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, again, I, I think that uh, people who are writing production server programs already use queues. I mean, this is the way most large server things are decomposed. They aren't a giant you know, web of direct calls. There's queues invariably inside, inside everything. And they have a lot of great properties, right? They decouple producers and consumers, right? Who's putting the things on one end of this? Who cares? Who's on the other end? Nobody cares, right? They don't know about each other. It's somewhere down there, someone's going to take this thing. Right? They're first class. You know, there's that queue. There's that conveyor belt right there. You can go. You can kick it, touch it. You can talk about it, name it, um, bump into it. You know, it's, it's, out, it's outside. Um, they're enduring, right? Uh, the person who's on this end putting boxes on it takes a break, and somebody else comes up. And the person on the other end is sick today, and somebody else comes out. Well, this conveyor belt is still there. It's there in spite of people coming and going. Uh, potentially, because it's first class and external and a thing, um, it's, it's an easier place to hook on some monitoring and uh, supports multiple readers and writers. So of course, there's nothing new to invent. It's just a matter of finding stuff. So um, the thing to be found in this case is CSP, which goes back to Tony Hoare's work in the, in the 70s, uh, sort of like the parallel uh, track as actors in the CSP. You know, so pick, pick your fight. Um, so we're going we're gonna to take this side with, uh, with Core Async and bet on CSP, as many others have. And it has some very interesting characteristics, maybe not, always in the, not, not all in the first paper, but over time, CSP has come to uh, represent first-class channels uh, as being the only way that independent processes interact with one another. There's no shared state except for these channels. Um, the semantics are blocking by default, which means that you can also use them for coordination. Uh, which is quite interesting. So it's not just a primitive for conveyance. It can be a primitive that allows you to say, you know, um, stay here until somebody's ready for me, or vice versa. Um, 
they can also be buffered and, and therefore allow for, for some asynchrony between the uh, producers and consumers. And uh, you know, there's a long set of history behind this OCAM and uh, uh, implementations for Java. And of course, the most recent uh, rendition that sort of makes this first class and a central point of language is uh, the Go language. Um, so we're, we owe everything about what you're going to see to all of this prior work. Um, but there are lots of cool attributes to this, right? The multi-reader, multi-writer part is important. You can pass endpoints around as first-class things. The other cool thing about um, CSP and channels is that they support choice um, via uh, a, a, um, a mechanism called either select or alt, depending on what language or what paper you're reading. And the, the purpose there is that you can wait on one or more of a set of I.O. operations on channels. Those includes both writes, reads, and timeouts. Uh, in addition, uh, through time and in the academic literature and work, um, there is uh, formalisms and proofs and things like that that can be used to help you reason formally about uh, systems built in this style. There's nothing in that area yet done for, uh, for core async. So there are already people that have done this. There's a very nice implementation of CSP for Java. Uh, called Java CSP. People have tried stuff in Scala. Um, but both of these implementations are tied to real threads. They basically use real threads as processes, one to one. Um, and we want to do something else for Clojure. In particular, we want to try to cr create an implementation of this, uh, uh, this approach that works both for Clojure and Clojure Script. Uh, and that supports both the problem of, I want to use real threads and, and real blocking, which still has utility. Um, if you do not have an arbitrary number of connections you need to support, if you have a small server with a finite number of processes, it can be more efficient and have higher throughput to use genuine threads and real blocking than to force everything to go through the mechanism of, uh, of a thread pool. Uh, but if you are trying to target um, uh, arbitrary uh, connection counts or work on a platform that doesn't have threads at all, which would be uh, the JavaScript engine, you need something else. And so the idea here, if there's any a um, new idea in Core Async is just to implement this technology on platforms that weren't designed for it. Like if you look at Go, it has a runtime engine that's oriented around this. Uh, and to uh, get the more efficient uh, use of threads and thread pools by leveraging the kind of immersion of control technology that was used in C-sharp async. Because right? that's what you need to take uh, code that should logically be blocking and instead turn it into data, and eventually consume a thread from a thread pool. So we're, that's, the, that's the idea. So if we can do this, this is really great, right? Because we can, we can deal with traditional threaded apps with low thread counts. We can approach uh, you know, designs for high connection count servers that are efficient. Um, you can deal with evented server APIs like those provided by Node and Vert. And uh, you know, we can finally try to make some sanity in browser development. Uh, not targeted currently by Core Async has anything to do with extending this over the network. All right, so Core Async itself, what is it? It's a library. Um, it's, it's about fundamentally coordinating between processes using channels. But the processes you can think of as independent threads of activity, they may be real threads or they may be these inversion of control threads where you write code that looks like it's doing X, do Y, do Z in a row and blocking in the middle. And uh, that process is turned into data whenever the blocking occurs, and the th real thread is relinquished. So we'll call those inversion of control threads, and we'll, you know, threads like this. But logically, they're threads, and the semantics are the same. We want the semantics of threads and the semantics of blocking in all cases, because it allows us to write linear code. And then we'll connect these things with these queue-like channels and target both platforms. So the, the first thing you need to be able to do is create a thread or create a process. And there's two ways to do it. Uh, there's the thread call, uh, which is a lot like the uh, future call, except this uh, you know, could tap into different thread pools. Uh, and it's clear about what you're doing. When you say thread, you get an actual real thread. And when you use the APIs within this thread, you get real blocking. Uh, so it's not quite as, you can't create as many of these arbitrarily as you could with the next ones. Uh, but when you want real threads and you know what you're doing, um, you can get high throughput with something like this. And then we have Go. And Go is the same kind of thing. It creates a logical thread. 
Um, it runs the block inside of it in this mode whereby if you issue any blocking calls, this uh, uh, mechanism will come into play, create an inversion of control state machine out of your code, and, and register it on the handler for the uh, asynchronous uh, callback. Um, so we're going to talk about that as a thread where blocking we're going to call parking, which essentially uh, relinquishes the thread and takes the code and parks it somewhere for its resumption later. All right, so channels themselves, what are they? They're like queues, right? A queue, you put something on one end, you take stuff off the other end. That's it. That's what they're about. Put stuff in one end, take stuff out the other end. You can have multiple writers. You can have multiple readers. Fundamentally, channels are blocking. Like, with that, if you don't touch them and do anything else, they're blocking. That means that uh, if somebody comes in to read and no one's written anything, it waits. If somebody comes in to write and no one's waiting to read, the writer waits. So they block on both sides. Um, they can be, un I mean, by default, they're unbuffered. We also support some fixed buffering. So I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so the API is pretty straightforward. You create a channel with Chan. Uh, Chan with no arguments creates an unbuffered channel, which is essentially synchronous rendezvous. Uh, you can say Chan with N, which gives you a buffer of that size, or Chan with a buffer, and there's a couple of API calls that allow you to create buffers. Then we can put with uh, put, that's what, how we, we read that, right arrow bang. Uh, right angle bang, and that's the parking variant, right? That's the one that will park the thread that must be used within a Go block. Um, the other variant is the double bang, and you can read those as blocking, put blocking, and uh, all those flavors, and this will go throughout the API. If there's a double bang, it's a blocking call. You read it as blob, blo blocking, so put blocking, and none of those are available on ClojureScript, on JavaScript, because there are no threads to block. Similarly, there's take and take blocking, and close. What's really useful about this, if you're using it on the JVM, is that you can mix and match these. So you can have a bunch of Go threads, and you can have actual real threads. So you can make blocking calls and parking calls on the same channels, on different ends of the same channels. It all fully interoperates, um, which can be extremely useful. So the buffers themselves, again, normally we're unbuffered, or it, by default we're unbuffered. Uh, and that acts as a rendezvous, like I said. Readers wait for writers and vice versa. Um, if you supply a fixed buffer, you use n of some value, then uh, writes will succeed right away until the buffer is full, and then the writes will block, uh, you know, block like this. And then there are two flavors of buffers that will never block a writer because they've incorporated a policy about what to do when they're full. Um, and one is a sliding buffer, which effectively walks across and drops the uh, newest stuff, and a dropping buffer, which is if you come to it with new stuff and it's full already, it just drops whatever you send. And they will never block um, the provider. Um, what we, will not pro we do not provide and will not provide are unbounded buffers. This is just a recipe for a broken program. It's just like, I don't feel like seeing this bug till later, so I'll make an unbounded <laughs> buffer. Uh, I'm not going to help you do that. We've already probably rejected the patch request a couple of times, and we'll keep doing it. I mean, just uh, hopefully people will get tired of submitting it. Uh, just don't do it. I mean, you're, what's beautiful about this is that you can establish a policy. Eventually, we'll have a, a recipe for providing other policies um, with more sophistication. Uh, but you know, make a decision. You need to make a decision here. You can't just have stuff piling up all around in memory and not be thinking about it. So uh, it's, a, it's a value proposition of, of CSP and of, of Core Async that you're thinking about these things and making choices. So the other cool thing, extremely cool thing about uh, CSP and about um, uh, channels is the fact that they offer choice. So it's quite frequent that you want to make, uh, you want to put a, a state machine in particular uh, in a state where it's waiting for one or more possible activities or operations to succeed. Um, and uh, that can be a really difficult thing to do. That's something, for instance, that none of the Java um, Q uh, primitives support at all. Windows has some nice uh, primitives for wait on multiple things, uh, but Java does not. Uh, obviously, sockets do have select and whatever. So uh, alt it, and the two flavors of alt, alts are um, are functions that take a set of operations. Uh, an operation is one of two things. If it's just a channel, it means try to read something from this channel. If it's a, a vector with a channel and a value, it means try to put this on a channel. 
and uh, alts will return um, whenever one of those things becomes ready to complete. Uh, and by default, it will be random. There's also a priority option that will let you say, try them in this order. Uh, what's really important about the choice is that one and only one operation will complete. So you're going to ask for, you know, let me know when any one of these things has happened, but only one of them will happen. It will be as if all the other pending requests you made were canceled. And you just got the one thing. And you get a return value, which indicates, in the case of take, it's just the value. In the, uh, uh, in the case of take, where you had multiple channels, it's going to tell you which channel actually succeeded and what the value was. In the cases of put, it's just going to be like, OK, that worked. That channel put worked. And then there's a macro that combines this function with, uh, with cond, you know, with, the, with the logical branching. So basically, you say alt bang. Uh, which this is not a function now, this is a macro. And you supply one or more sets of operations you want to attempt, right? The whole set of operations is going to be tried sort of in parallel. And uh, the first thing that's available to complete will be uh, the result of the condition. So we have, uh, oh, I think I have arrows here, let's see. So we have the operations themselves. The first two are uh, reads, try to read from C or T, or try to read from X, or try to put this val to out, um, and, or if none of them are ready right now, just return 42. Then we have uh, expressions, right, which would be the result. If C or T uh, returns a value, then we want to uh, grab that value and call it val and grab the channel that actually succeeded, because it could be C or T, and call that CH. And then we'll call foo with those two things. So we have a binding uh, and then some expressions. So this is a, you know, it's a macro that is an expression. Uh, it's not got all the, you know, gook of go with uh, statements. Um, and it will return one of the values. So you're going to try multiple operations, um, and you can have a default if none of them are ready. Otherwise, you'll block waiting for one of them to succeed. You can get the value that you, know, you desire as a result of that particular operation uh, succeeding. So it's like alt plus cond. So how do you do timeouts? Because a lot of times what happens is you know, you're setting off all these blocking things, but you don't want to wait forever. Um, what's really cool about Go is that they uh, decided to make timeouts channels themselves. And that's a really good idea. So well worth copying. Uh, so you just create a timeout by calling timeout with a number of milliseconds. You get a channel that closes after that number of milliseconds. So you can put that into an alt. Um, and what will happen is either you're going to get something from the thing that's not a timeout, or the timeout will close. And that will cause your alts to have a completed operation, which is the closing of the, of the timer channel. But the cool thing about it is that timeout now is a real thing, as opposed to how many people like putting timeouts in API calls. Yeah, that stinks, right? Especially if you tried to coordinate multiple things, or you know, you're just not sure how long to wait, or you're trying to do stuff in a loop where you have to keep um, trying things, but you're trying to have an overall counter go down, so you have to keep recalculating that timeout, smaller, 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 smaller. And now you can just create a timeout once and say, I'm going to try all this stuff in a loop for three seconds. So you create a three-second timeout, and you keep passing that same thing into every API call, the same one, because it's either going to complete or not, um, and you can just reuse it. So you can share them, which is very powerful. So obviously, if you know Go, this is very similar. Um, it's, it's like Go, but uh, the things that are different are all of the operations, everything I've shown you, they're all expressions. It's for a functional programming language. There's no statements. You don't need to have state to start interoperating with channels, because channels are a state mechanism already. Um, it's a library. It's not a language feature. It uses macros to do what it does. Um, and the macros are quite interesting, and we'll have to have other talks about those. Um, but the Go macro is the thing that inverts control and sets up the state machines for you. Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that alts is a function. You can map it. It's variadic. It supports a runtime variable number of operations. You can't do that with any uh, construct in Go, because they're all statements. And we support priority. So, um, so how do we integrate this into our world, right? Because we're not going to get everybody to change their APIs to use channels, right? They already use callbacks. Are, you know, are we doomed? Uh, and the answer is no, right? The, the, the trick is, um, as soon as you're in a handler and something comes in the handler, just put it in a channel, and that's it. You should be done. Uh, don't put anything more uh, there. Uh, so we actually have, because the uh, operators that put like the right angle, um, yeah, the right angle bang, put it can only be used inside Go, and you're not in a Go block in this event handler, right? You just like on mouse click 
That wasn't in a go block. Uh, what do you do? Uh, we have two calls, put and take, which can be used from outside of go blocks um, that are asynchronous and they'll just enqueue the request return right away. Um, it's sort of an entry point from the edges of your system into the channel based system. So you're talking about a process that wasn't part, you know, wasn't really a CSP process, has got some input. You use put to introduce it into this system. And so there's a similar take, which you know, reverts control. This is a way to get out, for instance, in JavaScript and get a callback back. So speaking of JavaScript, so what do we do there? Um, you know, this is <laughs> the browser. It's just all callbacks. There's 100% callbacks. And uh, again, this is totally fine. Everything I'm showing you, especially everything about the Go blocks, not the ones that, not the thread ones, it all works in the browser, all works in ClojureScript. Uh, if you read uh, David Nolan's post about this, he's doing you know, fantastic things that are exactly what this was designed to do. Um, right? You just uh, revert control immediately in your handler. Right? Don't put any logic in your handlers. Just take the event, turn it into data, put it on a channel, and be done with it. And that will let you put your world right side, right side up. Uh, so it's just a way to restore the separation of concerns, right? Instead of fragmenting your logic and building all these little pieces everywhere, you keep your logic together, you use these bridges from channels to get stuff to route through. Um, so the model essentially looks like this, right? In contrast to the first one, that you're going to just take inputs and put them on channels. You're going to have your logic all together. It can consume from multiple channels. It can put on multiple channels. It can coordinate with other logic and other instances of the logic because it's, it's many to many. Um, but it's, it's all together, and it puts it on channels, and eventually those reach, reach the out, outside world. Um, and uh, so I, the, the, the super critical thing is this part of the talk, okay? Because we have two solutions here that uh, on the tin, Right? They're the same. These let you efficiently do asynchronous programming. It's like, great. It's a feature. Awesome. Dude, let's go do it. Right? But they're really, really different. The characteristics are completely different. So it's a battle. Direct versus indirect. Right? So how many differences can you see between these things except for some colors? It looks like, uh, you know, it looks like more of a hassle, right? I have five things down here. I had Four things up there. Always a bad measure. So what happens to your logic in the direct system? It's split up into tiny pieces and spread out through callback handlers. In an indirect system, it's coherent. right? It's all together. It's linear. right? What happens on your callback? It directly calls your logic, which directly calls the output. It's all this big chain of fire, 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 um, unless you manually introduce some more asynchrony. Right? It's synchronous. Right? Channels can be synchronous or not. Right? We can set them up with, with no buffering and, and actually cause workflow and back pressure waiting, or we can add buffering and get some more asynchronous, asynchrony there. We still have, uh, have choices in the logic itself. Right? What's the arity of the callback to the callee? It's built in. It's like you, you gave them a piece of code to call. You, they call that code. It's the one-to-one. -one. Button click calls the thing. On socket calls the whatever. Right? It's end-to-end -end here. Right, with asynchrony. How many people can feed this channel? As many as you want. How many people can consume it? As many as you want. Um, so you can share the work. You can have multiple sources. You can do routing. Um, you can create these relationships dynamically. You can pass the channel to talk to dynamically. This other stuff has got code. I made code, and the code has got like what to call up above. Right? So that's all implicit. Where am I going from here? It's like inside this piece of code. Where am I going from here? I don't know. I mean, there's going to be some code that wires this stuff together, which I'm going to be able to see and think about um, and co cooperate with and possibly manage dynamically, something you can't possibly do in the other, uh, in the other scenario. Where is the shared state? Well, sort of an internal implementation detail of you know, whatever you had to do to try to make your state machine cross multiple callback handlers, which is usually just a real incredible mess. Right? Where is it here? It's external. Right? It's not like there's no state. Right? There is state. There, of course there's state. It's a big machine. Right? It moves stuff from there out the other side. Right? But in the top, we're making function calls. But how do we know we're using function calls wrong up top? Right? We, functions calling functions calling functions. There's nothing wrong, right? That's a call chain. We do that all the time in functional programming. But what else do we also do? 
we pay attention to the return values, right? Function calling, function calling, function, getting the return, using it, getting the return, using it, getting the return, using it is fine. That's function composition to have a stack of functions serve an algorithmic purpose. Now, that's not what we're doing up top, right? We're shoveling stuff across functions, ignoring the return values, and trying to spew stuff out into the real world at the other end. Um, so uh, having, the, having the state be external is totally fine. It's now clear that there is state. And I think this is very, very interesting, right? These states are different, right? The shared state that you have between two pieces of logic in order for them to communicate with each other is going to be place state. It's going to be, I put something in there, you know, I squirreled away some acorn so that either when I come back or this other handler comes in, they know that I'm in the middle of doing this and they should not do that. Or, you know, we've, we've got six of these and we need four more before we can proceed. Um, there, there's going to be the shared state, which is a set of places that you're using to, uh, to update things. But I think what's really cool about first class channels is that they expose a subset of state, and it's a very interesting and far safer one, which I'll call flow state, right? Uh, which is just about all you can do with this kind of state is put stuff in it, and then you really don't know anything more about it. Or you can take stuff out of it, and you really don't know how it got there. And uh, the analogy I'd make is, you know, let's say you work at a factory, right? And you get into the factory, and you have your jacket, right? And you're going to do something with your jacket. Uh, would you rather hang it on a coat hook or uh, put it on a conveyor belt that's moving, or dump it down a laundry chute, or put it in the back of the UPS truck that's about to leave. Well, it's quite, there's a difference, right? Those are all places to put your jacket, right? But what, what is it about the coat hook? Right? You expect to go back there at the end of the day and see your jacket still there. Of course, if there's only a few coat hooks and there's a lot of jackets, you have this contention problem because right, it's a place. But you would never put your jacket on any of those other kinds of places, states, um, because you know they're, gonna, they're flow. They're going to go away. It's going to go on that conveyor belt. It's going to you know, go somewhere else. It's going to go down that chute, and you can't recover it. The UPS truck's going to drive away. And that's good, because you can't possibly um, have your life depend on going back and seeing the same thing there again. So it's not really like state the way shared state and place-oriented state is. Flow state is much simpler. It's much easier to read, reason about um, and much safer uh, because you don't, do not have this expectation of coming back. Right? And then in any case, if, if you're running any of these things in, a, in an environment in which that not only is there you know, um, cooperative concurrency, but there's actual real simultaneous concurrency, then any kind of state, whether it's a channel, or, or the shared state there is going to have to have some coordination, right? So we don't all step on each other. But in the first case, whose problem is it? It's your problem, right? That coordination, getting that thread safe is your problem. In this problem, in the, in the, in the bottom uh, case, it's my problem, right? It's the, it's, the, it's the core async library problem. And once we get it correct, I think we've already gotten it correct, but it, it's correct for everybody. Right? It's, share, it's correctness is shared by everyone. Uh, so, you know, which do you want? Uh, also, the logic, right? When do, you, when do you decide to handle an event that comes through a callback handler? You don't decide, right? <laughs> you're like, you're just passive. You, you get called whenever you get called, right? When do you have it when you have uh, channels and, and uh, alt? Whenever you choose, right? If you don't want to go read that channel right now, don't do it. Right? If you think it's more important to read this other channel or to write to these channels or to wait for 10 minutes or to go ask somebody, you're not a passive, um, uh, a passive recipient of, of control being driven from an external event uh, unless you've chosen to do that. Right? So I think the problem I labeled first is the one I want to call out now. Right? This first thing is using code as a cue. Right? Call to call to call to call. Um, when we should always be using data. Again, it's one of these things. We never make this mistake when we go over wires. We never make this mistake. When we go over wires, we don't. The reason is because we can't. Wires don't let us make function calls. Right? We always have to turn it into data, put it in a buffer, enqueue it, 
shovel it over, DQ it, do whatever. Maybe we'll map it again to a function call and we'll recreate RPC, but there's no RPC. Wires don't do RPC. They're not code. They don't have entry points. Um, you can't invoke them. Uh, so we never do this then, but it's a good example of another thing that when we bring it inside, um, we make this mistake. And when we're shoveling stuff around inside our programs, it's not different than when we're shoveling around between boxes. It's not different. Shouldn't be, shouldn't be a different way to think about it. So um, there's a sense in which this, the direct callback approach is, is intimacy, right? It's, it's making pieces aware of the other pieces, right? The call, callback event knows who to call. The caller knows where it goes next. And it's all code. And, uh, and there's a sense in which using channels and this indirection is ignorance. And we all know that ignorance is bliss. Uh, and it ends up that uh, in systems, it's also, it's also bliss. And uh, at least in systems, <laughs> intimacy is pain. This is where the pain comes from. This is why, this is why it's painful. So uh, here's a little bit of code, just so that I don't just show ideas on the screen and get complained about. Uh, so code, this is a great example from uh, Rob Pike's uh, Rob Pike's examples for Go, and it's just nice because it just shows everything. Um, I'm not showing the supportive code, but the basic idea here is that you've got a job, you're trying to do this search, you need to come up with a web, an image, and a video result for it. You have a couple of possible sources of these answers. They may reply at different speeds. Um, you want to bound the amount of time that you're going to take to do this entire job to 80 milliseconds. You want to try to get everybody to do the job and take the first results you get and get out. So the function fastest takes a query and, and uh, you know, two uh, sources, right, two URI endpoints that it can call. It's going to create a channel. It's going to set off Go processes to go and attempt to do that RPC with each of those web servers and get an answer. And, and each of those uh, callbacks are going to go and take the answer they get and put it on that channel. And then fastest is going to return the channel. So essentially, you can read this as set off, a, set off two processes, racing to put an answer on a channel, and return the channel. And you do that similarly for the images and similarly for the video. So we end up with three channel results, right? And we're going to set off asynchronous processes that are going to go and say, read from that channel, then put it on this shared channel. So, and it's going to do one, right? So that read and then put back, that's the RPC kind of thing. And there's no, you can build right, that um, C-sharp style async RPC stuff out of channel read and channel write like this, and it's a common idiom, right? Uh, so it's going to read each one and put it on there, and then we have a loop. And the cool thing is that this loop, it doesn't know where this stuff comes from. It's just been told there are going to be three answers on this channel. Uh, don't spend more than 80 milliseconds trying to read them. And that's what it does. It goes through it. It makes an alt call, and it says, try to read from the channel or time out. Uh, take the value and just add it to the vector. So this vector is going to return uh, up to possibly three results or um, nils if no results are available, but it's going to be done in 80 milliseconds no matter what. Um, given that spec for this is the job you want to do, um, that would be really hard to write without stuff like this. So what do you get from using this kind of technology? You get a separation of concerns. You get it back, right, because you've lost it. You get coherent and linear logic. Right? And you move away from mutation. You know, if you have a state machine inside your process, you can implement that using recursion instead of uh, having to create internal state with traditional measures. Um, you get coordination possible. You can get back pressure with this, which is quite uh, useful uh, and difficult to get otherwise. You can dy dynamically reconfigure these networks, and you can use your thread pools and your thread uh, uh, resources efficiently. So I'd just like to thank the guys that helped me work on it, and particularly uh, Timothy Baldridge did the Go macro inversion of control stuff, and it's really cool, and when he talks about it um, at some conference in the future, make sure you catch it. So this is where you can get the code and try it out. Uh, it's on GitHub. There's docs there. There's now a Maven uh, artifact for it, and there's a blog post that describes it more. But that's it. Thanks.